even with the guilt of the part of turning away from sin, part of, of being part of the spirit. So. Well, with consequences, you know, if you stole something or broke something, you can pay to have that fixed, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. There, there's there's ways as far as the consequences that you can make things right or better. But with the guilt, the, the problem with guilt is it can lead to things like depression and anxiety and cause all sorts of other physical issues with you on a guilt that you're just hanging on to and it's eating you up. And some people have taken guilt to the point of just giving up on life. Yeah, I, I do agree. Yeah. Um, it's different. It's different. It's different. It's different. There's things that I'm certainly thankful for in my life, right? But at the same time, you know, I have that in the back of my mind. It's, it's, it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. you know, so. okay. Any other thoughts on that? Well, just that in theory, we should be releasing our guilt to God. Yes. We choose to hold on to it. God has forgiven us, and we're not holding on to that baggage. That's not That's something correct. that we're supposed to carry or struggle with, but we in our sinful nature continue to yeah. grab on to it. That, that pride gets God us. God does want to comfort us and take <laughs> yes. that from us, too, and wash us clean, white as snow. Yeah, and you, you have that own personal pride. You just... Why would we do that? That's the thing, because we do. Over and over and over. We do. What does it mean? It's like a self-destructive kind of thing. Well, it's simple. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's our nature. It's, it says it's it is human. sinful human nature. The, yeah. the fact that you would admit to a holy God, like I've done wrong, uh, sometimes might be easy if it's, you know, what we would consider a minor sin, although sin is sin. Um, and more major ones, you just, that takes a lot to actually admit that to anyone and, and we just hold it inside and, and a lot of i've done it I'm, I'm sure some of you have done it people out there are, are dealing with you'll see the the consequences of people holding on to guilt over the years it, it affect them and then in in that aspect it affects other people there isn't there isn't one <laughs> This study is about having open discussion on this stuff more than it's a, I'm going to give you an exact right answer. Okay. That should be a good thing. You see, you need like a drug addict or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Gets arrested doing something for their next, you know, fix, I guess. And then they get arrested and they get some years, but that gets them clean. And so the mind, and then they, it is and i've seen people who have been with stuff like that that have taken their burdens and just left them at the cross and watching the change in that their their uh, mentality and stuff is just phenomenal that that, that release of it's actually it was actually cool before the nice thing about getting here early in the evening time is I get to go spend some quiet time in the sanctuary and it's really nice sitting up at the altar and just talking to God. If you've never done it before, um, if you ever want to, we can make sure the doors open. But it's really nice having that private quiet time um, and just share your your burdens or share your struggles with God in a private setting is means a lot to me when I get to do. It. So it's really nice. All right, any more thoughts on that? Okay, our sins burden us with guilt. To continue on that, Keith was a church member. He confided in the prison chaplain. He said, when I sobered up, I was horrified at what I'd done. I have two daughters. If someone raped them, I'd want to kill them. What have I done? Can there be forgiveness for a sin as bad as what he committed? Yes. Maybe. Can you think Murder of anyone else? Yep. What did David do? Adultery. Murder and adultery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can forgive us for any sin if you're truly repentant. Mm -hmm. Yes. So forgiveness isn't based on the severity or mildness of sin as we like. We like to compare them between misdemeanor and felony sins. You know, this one isn't quite as bad, but this one is more bad. Where in God's eyes, sin is sin. One is the same as the other in severity.
to a holy God. Um, and, and you mentioned David. I'm glad you did. I was going to go into a few of them. Uh, Paul supervised the stoning of Stephen. Uh, Peter cursed and swore that he didn't know Jesus. Moses committed manslaughter. And of course, there's David. And all of these were forgiven. And we're going to get into what David had to say. That'll be the very first reading that we have. Any more thoughts before we go to Psalm 51? Okay, if we can turn to Psalm 51, please. And I'd like to get a few readers, unless somebody just wants to read the whole thing. Go ahead. Okay, I'll turn back on. Greg, okay. Go ahead. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blood on my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgression and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned, and then what is evil in your sight? So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at first, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. I read all the way through. Your mom's next. Okay. okay. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. All right. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. Do, you do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. May it May it please you to prosper Zion, to build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the sacrifices of the righteous and burnt offerings offered whole. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Okay, thank you. And as we mentioned already, what was sin did David commit? Adultery. Adultery and murder. Okay, pick out phrases. Well, yes, that too. <laughs> Being where he shouldn't have been. Um, he should have been with his with his soldiers. Eight or ten yeah. Well. All right. So pick out phrases from the psalm that show that David had a keen awareness of his sin and guilt. It says my sin was always before me. Yes. Since it gives you you only have a sin and what is in your sight. That's a big acknowledgement, telling God I've sinned against you. Right from the start, he says, uh, I was guilty of sin from birth. And, and I think the reason why I wanted to put that in is because it's not, and it goes to what Jesus said and, and what people sometimes forget. It's not the actual act of the sin, but it's the thought of the sin to begin with. And those thoughts are with you from birth. So he understands that it's it's not just what he did; it's the thought and the, the planning and everything else that, that's in in him from from being a human or being an imperfect person. Yeah, the sin didn't start when when the adultery was committed. It started long before that, and there was plenty of opportunity for that to not go that far. But then again, we all can look back and say, I just made a different decision. And verse 14 says, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Uh, yes. Even because if I say, have mercy on me, it goes automatically. There's no other way. 
And this is David pouring out his heart, not because he's just said, I've done something wrong. Anyone remember what happened prior to this? He didn't just say, oh, I've done something wrong. Let me confess to God. Someone had a conversation with him. Yes, he did. So you think he was, do you think being called out or being found out was what drove his guilt or would he have had to go regardless? I'm, I'm inclined to think that he thought that no one would find out. The guilt's there. But, okay, you, but I the, think they do. If, you, if no one finds out, the guilt will always be there. Mm -hmm. Yes. And regardless of whether it's found or not, out or not, God knows what you did. Exactly. But he's acknowledging to God, I sinned against you. It's like God knew this all the time. Yeah. There's yeah. like another song, I don't remember the number, but where David says when he didn't confess his sin, it was like his bones were wasting away with him. I yeah. get to what you're saying, Victor. That's like when we don't, you know, deep down. I think I read that last night. I think it's 32. That sounds right. Well, David hadn't quite acknowledged his sin at that point until Nathan, you know, he had to be corrected and rebuked before he really, it really pricked his heart right. to be sorry. You know? Yeah, would. You don't think anybody's going to find out it's all covered up nothing's going to happen and someone comes up and says oh by the way i know what you did <laughs> and all of a sudden it's uh oh somebody really does know yes um blessed is he whose sins are forgiven whose sins are covered um i acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity yeah verse three is i said i will confess where is it when i kept silent my bones wasted away through my groanings all the day long yep so it, it was actually a burden on him from his sin. Mm -hmm. But if you don't think anybody knows, yeah. just kind of. Do we know yeah. if he was like, like wrote those songs like before or after the baby died? Or like, I don't know. Because that's pretty, I feel like. I hadn't thought about that. Well, he was. Um, that's what we do with him. I have so much. Yeah, he was he was told it was going to happen. I'm sure he was. I'm wondering if he he was wondering now that I've done this confession, will I he actually save the baby? You know, kind of wondering, because um, that was when he mourned for I think three days, was it? And then got up and yeah, it got some things. Right, like it seemed like he didn't question God or say like, why did you say that? Just went on with his day and took off his sackcloth. God was right in what he said and justified in what he did. Um, I think that um, David would have eventually, from reading the Psalms and reading them over and over and over and hearing his pleas to God when he was running away, when he was uh, being chased, he had, he, God had made him the apple of his eye. And I think that uh the holy spirit would have whether he was found out or whether uh he was not he felt the love of the lord so deep from all of his psalms that he sings uh praising him with uh, string instruments all the things that he did i think that he would have eventually come to god and told he, he sought him every day there was no way that he would be able to think in his heart that God didn't see what he did to Uriah. I just feel that with his whole uh, being, he uh, generally praised the Lord till he danced with until his clothes were torn off. He, he just had a zeal for the Lord. And when he asked the Lord to create in him a clean heart, he had to he had to have known that God saw this. I like that part. Went up to it. That's a good point. Um, I like that part of 51 created me a clean heart. I, I grew up singing that many Sundays in church. Um, 
and has uh, uh, it's just a special part of the Psalms to me. Com com um, Creating me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit. And we need that every day. Okay, any more thoughts on this? Um, guilt's invisible. You can't measure it or weigh it, yet perhaps it's the heaviest of burdens. What is guilt? You're guilty because you knew what you did was wrong, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can ever do about it. And so it kind of weighs heavy in your mind and on your heart that you know what you did wasn't the right thing to do. And even after the consequences might be over, you realize what I did was wrong, mm -hmm. and it hurt people, it hurt God. Um, and, there's, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's, it's there forever. Your actions are permanent, you know? So, That's a real good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. It's not about the feelings. It's just the fact that you know concrete thing that you know this was not right it's like self-judgment you know where you okay. are okay. judging yourself just like you said for what you know in retrospect maybe you should have known at the time too but you know what you did was wrong and so it's just this judgment on yourself that you never let up on mm -hmm. And you, like Charlie said, yeah. you can't change it. You know you did it. So you're just like self-loathing or self-judgmental. And if it's somehow harmed other people, then you're beating yourself up because not only did I do this wrong, but now it affected other people in a right. negative way. And so you just kind of pile in that guilt on. I think we've probably all been there <laughs> at some point in time in our life. Okay. If you want to sum it up on in a book, you can look at crime and punishment. It's something that it's there and it never goes away. And, and everything that's around you is focused on that. So you everything you see reminds you of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. It kind of falls into the next question of how does guilt manifest itself? Mm -hmm. Speaking of deciduous heart, I'm sorry. Yeah. It, it can have a devastating effect on somebody. Judas. We'll get to him. <laughs> but yes, uh, you're fine. <laughs> he's. I think he's on the next page. <laughs> I'm sure it, it can affect moods. It can affect the way that we make other decisions. It can lead to making other bad decisions, which makes it even worse, which piles even more on. And you just end up, like I've told people before, when you're in a hole, quit digging. And sometimes I forget to take my own advice. And you just keep digging that hole in one bad decision after another. And you just piled on even more and more. Um, and it, it, it absolutely can. It, it can affect you physically, um, emotionally, and in many different ways. I think, um, Chris, I think also, you know, can cause depression, um, not knowing how to deal with it. That is very true. Okay, so where did David find hope in answer to his guilt? The Lord. That's true. If you look at verse 17, okay. he looks at himself, he says, I have a broken spirit or was a broken and contrite heart. It's something that God would inspire. So mm -hmm. he's able to, I mean, that he's kind of, to, uh, you know, to use like a, to use the language of addiction for when he's hit bottom and God is there. God is there at the bottom of that valley. Yeah. Oh. For the Psalms that he wrote, the, all the praying that he did, that's very valuable pouring out his soul mm -hmm. onto what he was writing and what he was, what he was praying for. Yeah, there's a lot in his Psalms. Yeah. <laughs> there, a lot. There's a, a lot of a lot of comfort, um, but also you can see that, that journey he had uh, with God. I kind of think of the creating me a pure heart. Um, he's not asking, would you please give me a pure heart? He's just saying, God created me. Going to God, knowing that God is there and God will be there for you. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden everything's wiped clean as if it never happened. 
but knowing that God is there through dealing with the consequences, fixing what you can fix, but he's there removing your guilt and saying, I paid that price. You are forgiven. Um, giving you that comfort and that peace to move forward. He's confident in that he'll receive God's mercy. Yep. And so he knows he can go to him with this and not be shunned or cut off. That God and hasn't given up on him. Right. God will forgive and deliver him. Absolutely. And I like that he asks, you know, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. No matter what you've done, you have the joy of your salvation. You know, always. What I do cannot impact my salvation and joy I can have because of that. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's refocus on the key point. After his crime and while in prison, Keith heard the gospel of Jesus, acknowledged that the Lord is forgiving, yet it's hard for him to feel forgiven or to forgive himself. Then one Christmas, he got a card in the mail. It was from the Ladies' Aid Society of the church. This small gesture lifted a large load of guilt. The ladies offered Keith the huge gift of forgiveness in the name of the one who came into our world to give forgiveness to us all. One way we carry each other's burdens is by forgiving sins and offenses, just as God in Christ has forgiven us. Sinners whose souls are burdened with the guilt and the need of reassurance of their redemption not just from the pages of the Bible, but from the mouths of Christian friends. So here's a thought. Have you ever had somebody say, if you say you've done something wrong, they just say, go ask God for forgiveness? It's kind of like they don't want to talk to you. I remember many years ago, it was in a non-denominational church I visited. Um, and I heard somebody get up because they like to do these testimonies and he confessed sins he'd been doing. And everybody cheered because he did the confession and stuff. There's one thing that I thought was missing. And afterwards I went up to him, uh, just him and me. And I said, in the name of Jesus, your sins forgiven, depart in peace. And he looked at me with tears in his eyes and said, I've never heard that before. Physically hearing that from one of us, we have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Someone confesses sin. We say, in the name of Jesus, your sin's forgiven. Reading it is one thing, but actually a fellow Christian saying, your sin is forgiven, like pastor does, beginning of the service. Well, we do that. Elders will do that with uh, the people that they keep up with. But just all of us have those keys. And I think, I know for me, it, it, you tend to forget that, um, that, hey, Jesus says they confessed their sin and said, I sinned, I did wrong. Well, your sin's forgiven. We have that responsibility to announce that. And that's not just for pastor because he's our pastor, but that is something for all of us. And something for us to remember. And then James talks about confess your sins to one another. It does. No, that's not on here. So when you can go ahead. Let's go. <laughs> I was wondering if you had read ahead. No. No, you go ahead. Go ahead with your. Well, I was just thinking that's important. As you mentioned, the basically get it off your chest a lot of times and then have somebody pronounce forgiveness for you yes yeah that i think today it seems like that is the part that we tend to forget is that we pronounce forgiveness we can pronounce forgiveness instead we just listen you know it'll be okay or try and help you out well we have that that key to use just as we have the key to use if someone refuses to repent of sin we are not to Forgive just to forgive. Oh, let's just give them forgiveness. No. There's a time and a place for everything. And I, and I kind of skipped it, so we'll jump back to it real quick. Um, considering a relationship, whether it's husband, wife, or close friend, or it could be children, whatever, what sins do you regularly forgive? Which ones are more difficult to forgive? 
And what sins do you feel you could never forgive? Forgive disrespectful children every day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter how it reaches the sin, right? Mm -hmm against the other person it's it, it's kind of like we don't have to like each other but we got to put up so it doesn't matter i could take you out of bat and beat you with a bat right uh you know one wow eventually eventually one day you know i'm gonna come back and we're gonna be like ah you know that time you went back and beat me with a bat <laughs> 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 Hey, there was one time. I don't need to go off topic. There was one time, right? Okay, we're talking about sins in the family, right? My grandfather got drunk as drunk can get, right? And he was sitting, and my grandfather missed like two or three things, right? From power to me. So me and my me and my great uncle are sitting around and we're talking, we're, you know, we're giving my, my grandfather a hard time because he's cutting the, the you know the turkey for, for Thanksgiving. He goes, we're going like Hey, don't move, miss a finger this year. You know what I'm saying? Like, and all of a sudden, you're blood <coughs> everywhere. I mean, clap like crazy. This guy turns to me, he's like, get out of my house. <laughs> Physically gets me, grabs me, pushes me, and starts kicking me out of his house. All right, then. Well, that, uh, hey, that's an exciting Thanksgiving. <laughs> we laugh about it now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it was plenty of time. <laughs> so the, the, the key to this question, or the, this, yes, this question is that it's actually a trick question. Because we don't um, put sin, we, we have a tendency to put sin in different levels. I can forgive this, not sure about this, never on this. But Jesus has forgiven every level, all of them. And we are called to do the same, even though some are harder than others. That was a question to make you think. Can you tell a story? You tell a story. Forgive you, forgive everybody. Sometimes, yeah. Don't forgive you. <laughs> sometimes you'll see somebody who's, uh, you know, the, the person that killed their loved one is on trial and uh, they've been found guilty and so on. And they'll come up to them and they'll say a few words and they'll say, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I see that, I was like, I don't think I can do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, you see, you, you see Christ in them, right? You, you, you know, sometimes I think, do they really forgive them? But seriously, I mean, to, to be able to say that to someone. Well, yeah, but they're not the ones that are saying it. It's the, the loved ones who are here and who are devastated, devastated by the loss are the ones that can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there was recently, there was a case, and I think it was that police officer that she accidentally walked in the wrong apartment. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the one to where at the sentencing, to where she broke down in tears and the family came over and gave, gave her a hug um, after she took the life of one of their loved ones. That's, that, that's you know, I'd, I'd hope I could be that gracious, but, you know. We tend to do weird things under, I wouldn't say weird, but we tend to do different things under Pressure we say well, I would never do that. Sitting in the most comfortable circumstance for people to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, I found yeah, it's easy to say that I would do this or I would do that more yeah. sitting in a classroom. Exactly. When, when you're when you're actually dealing with that. And that can also be an operation of God's grace, right there. Absolutely. Learning with that. I mean, I would. It would seem to me that 
for you to say, I forgive you for doing that, you would really have to do it because otherwise there's nothing you could say. You just want to come up and, you know, but you can't do that. But maybe, maybe at that point, you know, maybe God is, is reaching down right there and working grace and forgiveness and giving that person the ability to do that. Okay. You're a also. story like that that worked to me um, several years after World War II and she escaped the horrible circumstances of um, being in a Nazi death camp. Uh, she was actually let out of there by bureaucratic error, a piece of paper they let her out by accident, but she got out and um, sometime later, there were um, ex SS officers that were going around trying to reintegrate in society. Anyway, she ran into one of them, like at a church service, and he walked right up to her, recognized her. They recognized each other. He walked right up to her and stuck his hand out and said, You remember me? And she said, Oh, yeah, I remember you. And whatever their names were, his name. And uh, he said, I want to ask your forgiveness. And she said, I'm remembering this in her autobiography. She said she, she felt just absolute horror and disgust that this guy did this. But right after that, she felt like this um, incredible warmth and, and total forgiveness for this guy. She actually stuck her hand out and she hugged him and said, I do forgive you. She said, oh, Holding control. Those spend the rest of your life in prison, but I forget. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, I'm I, my dog is barking. Stop, Pico. Um, it's a, an example in. Uh, in uh in uh the uh david's life where he saw and had opportunity to um you know kill paul he was delivered in his hands but each time he had that he would not touch he said let me not touch the, the anointed he wouldn't bring he, he forgave him so we have that forgiveness even in, in david's life how he knew that he saw paul was was uh you know chasing him down to pits and everywhere but he still was able to forgive him You can ever try one more time. I don't know it's freshly re reconnected. Can you hear Hello, me? can you hear us? Can, I can hear you now. You couldn't hear me? Not at all. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and oh, say I'm, it again. I'm, okay. I was just saying that uh, David had the opportunity to uh, kill Saul many times. I mean, at least twice we know. Uh, but he went in and forgave him. So we have examples in David's life of how he he forgave his enemies, even with Absalom and, and everything of that nature. I'm not sure that he forgave him, though. I, I thought that he was, he felt that an obligation to uh, honor the person who had been anointed by God to be the leader. And he was not going to take his life without without knowing for sure that that's what God wanted or God had given him that, that mission, right? I mean, people like to quote, touch not God's anointing. Yeah. It comes from that story. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think it was anything about uh, forgiveness. It was just a matter of duty to, to God that, no, he's the person that was anointed to be king and who am I to end his life? Yeah. Okay. And he does still talk with like a lot of a lot of respect towards Saul that because he's not clearly warranted. Like it's one thing not to take his life, but it's another to, to speak of him and treat his family in the way he did and stuff too. So I think in some ways maybe maybe because he knew it was a God thing, he, he did kind of forgive him. We don't always have to feel like forgiving someone, but in his actions, 
because it seemed like he wasn't holding things against Saul, which is to his yeah. credit. And then the things that he said to Saul, it seems that he is wishing for reconciliation. I mean, he's like really wanting feelings. That's the solid feelings that go different directions. It's just knowing that it's something we should do. You know, I heard that from one talk to him about this exact same thing one time. Heard that the first time I ever heard that was from an uh, Orthodox priest. I say, don't follow your feelings. Yeah, don't follow your feelings. All sorts of troubles. Because that <laughs> feelings, quote, uh, the quote was exactly feelings are the devil's plaything. Well, there you go. What was that, Melissa? They lie. Yeah. Yes, they do. They lie. They lie. So all sins come with consequences. A high school senior was angry and upset when a girlfriend broke up with him. He unleashed his emotions by punching the wall in his dormitory room. Wall was made of concrete blocks. He spent the next hours in the emergency room and the next week in a cast. Isaac Newton's Star Law of Motion states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. The law of sin demonstrates that for every sin, there are numerous negative results that burden our lives. If I can get three people to open up to Matthew 26 um, and 27, with three parts of this to read, 26 verses 14 to 16. I'll get that. Okay, 26 verses 47 to 50. I can do that one. Do that one. And 27 verses 1 to 5. Would anybody like that one? Who? Okay. All right. Matthew 26, 14 to 16. And then one of the twelve, one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So they counted out like 30 pieces of silver. Then on Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. All right, verses 47 to 50. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged sin with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once, Jesus, going at once to Jesus, Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed them. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. All right, chapter 27, verses 1 to 5. Well, when it was early in the morning, the whole chief priests and the elders of the people plotted against Jesus to execute them. They tied him up, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. <laughs> now, when Judas, had, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus had been condemned, he regretted what he had done and returned to the thirty, and returned the thirty silver coins to the chief priests and the elders, saying, "I have sinned by betraying innocent blood." But they said, "What is that to you? You take care of it yourself." So Judas, Jesus, uh, so Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Then he went out and hanged himself. So what led to Judas' sin? Greed. Guilt. Greed. Yeah. Money. Had he even like been previously like stealing money but that they had been collecting? I can't remember the, that story. I don't remember. I find it interesting as well. Um, he, he was in charge of the money bag and sold okay. to it. I was yeah. trying to remember. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. That's it. It's like he'd always kind of yep. had that. And now, the thing is, I can't imagine how much 30 pieces of silver. I have no idea how much that is worth. But it can't possibly be that much to, right. to betray the man that you've been, been with for these years. Right. At least, at least more than 30 pieces of oh, silver. Oh, Victor, how much yeah. is 30 pieces of silver? Like, my, my, <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I just I, I find it interesting. He's one of the twelve. Yeah. He's not some it's nobody who doesn't all. know who Jesus is. And he's so there to make us to, all like. <laughs> yeah, this is equivalent to 120 denarii, so that's like 120 days wages. That's not a small amount of money. I think. 120 days so wages. So it's a third of a year, about. There you yeah. go. A bit of money. Four months. Four months. Yeah, so it's like 10 years of wages. Depends what your aim for your hourly rate is. Times <laughs> three. <laughs> Union scale. I read so, yeah. recently a commentary that um, 
Judas never called Jesus Lord. You were reading the stories in the last supper of um, upper room and everything. At no point did he ever call the Lord, he just called him rabbi. Mm -hmm. So that's the that. Okay. So. Yeah. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Yes. Hey, I also had a thought. I don't know, you know, we don't know his mind. Um, one thought came to my mind, maybe there was a lack of faith, thinking maybe that, you know, Jesus was all powerful, that he would rescue himself. And, you know, I guess, you know, this is just assumption. So, yeah. Yes, I find it interesting Jesus called him a friend. Well, I think I, I I somewhere heard like uh, read that it wasn't the motivation of the money as far as he was trying to push God's hand to make Jesus reveal himself. And that was not in his power to to push the narrative mm -hmm. and make Jesus, you know, get, Jesus was on his own schedule, but. Judas was trying to put him on a schedule of his own. Food for thought. That's something to think about. I hadn't thought about that. I have a note in my margin that I think I made at seminary that the Judas student in the greatest seminary of all time still betrayed Jesus. It humbles us and reminds us never to be complacent. That's actually a good point, being complacent. You know, and, and you think of the things he got, like, we all think, like, well, this could never happen to us, you know, because we're going to church, we're here on Wednesday Bible study, but, you know, like, but actually, I mean, like, he got offended, like Gaynell said, that Jesus didn't do it the way he would have, and he got offended that he didn't rebuke that lady who poured the perfume on him, and he could have sold that, you know, and it's tempting for us when God doesn't do what we want to start getting angry at him and that that slowly devolves into what he did yeah just as humbling mm -hmm. some old field saying in places he kills yeah that's true so judas tried to unbetray jesus to give and gave money back why is it not possible to undo a sin after it has been committed it's basic physics right <laughs> Oh, you know, we don't have the power. Right. Think about it. a harsh word. You can't take that back. Once the action is done, the action is done. You know, there are theories. Well, you know, like this scientists. word, why I should say. And you actually go faster than speed. All right, so the consequences of one sin led to other sins and still more consequences. Tell how this yeah, was in the case of Judas. Can you give an example of how this happens today? Well, you know, he has that guilt weighing heavy on his heart. And, mm -hmm. and that was probably the biggest consequence because like literally like nothing like actually happened to him. No one came and like beat him in the street for, you know, killing my savior. Like you wonder how one of the disciples might have talked to get revenge. Jesus didn't teach that, but they had all fled and he kind of abandoned him. So um, living nothing happened to him other than the kind of the weight of his own conscience. But this led him to take his own life, which I guess is, you know, the, the last sin you can you can make. Um, you know, because it's like, point. it's. Yeah. You know, to you giving up on God, again, God's forgiveness of you. Um, but he also, he also heard Jesus' words. You know, it's like, one of you is going to betray me. You do better if that person had not been born. And I think it kind of hit him all at once right there. Mm -hmm. Or it's like, you know, the what have I done kind of moment. And this happens in like all of our lives, you know. Some sins, you, you kind of hits you like a, like a Mack truck all at once. And it depends on how you respond to that. Some people don't respond very well. And it makes them make further bad choices, you know. I, I like that, and real good points. And I like the part where he says, I've sinned. They didn't say you're forgiven. They just said, go deal with it. What did that lead to? I'm not forgiven, no sense in living, you know? But I also think about what it says, which sins tend to forget other sins, or they do think about what the steps David went through. Mm -hmm. From the lust and then he acted on it, and then she got pregnant, and then he tried to cover it up. 
He was on a roll with the sin. Yeah, he was, and so he just kept stepping on down the line, trying to um, make his wrong right or make it look right to everybody <clears throat> that was involved. And you're right, I was having a part of it. Mm -hmm. And this is such a prime example of someone confessing their sins and the other person not responding the right way. Yep. Like you have David and Nathan and Nathan calling him on his sin, but also reminding him of to repent and of forgiveness. And here they're like, nope, not my problem. Yeah, that That's really, you, buddy. That really stuck out to me and obviously they're not believers, so they're right. not going to do the right thing. Confess the wrong people. If, you know, if it had been that way, you know, they could have offered him turn turn them back to God, maybe. Absolutely. I mean, suicide is is a sin too. It's giving up on life and trying to your your it's time for you to end yours or you can't reverse that. Um, okay. Any other thoughts on that? I know we're getting close to time. Um the devil likes to jump teams on us. He gets on the go sin team and says, yeah, that sin's awesome. Why don't you do that? And then as soon as you fall in, he goes, how dare you? Now God can't love you. It's right. tricky right there. That's really what happened. With Jesus, so. Yeah. Yes. So refocusing on a key point, when we sin, we can't avoid the pain and difficulty our sins cause. When others close to us sin, we're caught up in the swirl of chaos. That sin carries with it. Sin tears through our lives like a tornado. May God help us and may we help each other pick up the pieces and rebuild on a solid foundation of faith and godliness. So, in summary, sin's never pretty. It clogs us with its arteries, making it hard for our hearts to feel alive and well. It leaves messes in our lives like the aftermath of an explosion scatters debris everywhere. Explain how Christ is the answer to both the guilt. And the consequences. He's the one that he died for our sins. He's the one that can really remove the guilt because he paid for it. Yes. And as far as dealing with the consequences, he gives us grace. It's just based, based on what we have to face. Maybe he'll give us you know, help to work in the job that we can help him break out as long as we, you know. Same too, them and right. He, he takes away the guilt and he leads us through dealing with consequences. Um, he'll work the consequences for our good. And we have to remember that's also an opportunity for us to minister so it doesn't lead to other sins. Um, I know in the story here, and I kind of skipped over it, we're about a, out of time, but it talked about, uh, you know, a teenager um, gets pregnant and then the conversation of abortion comes up and all this other stuff or you there's if you know someone is going through this it's an opportunity for us to minister to stop this one sin after another episode that's going on and the guilt that they're going to have to deal with later for even more sin at times and to minister um, and share the gospel with them and be there to help them bear or bear their burden for them or help them bear their burden um, and that's what we're called to do. So I hope that you know got something out of this study. You don't have to deal with me next week. I don't know who's teaching next week, but I have enjoyed these few lessons. Um, really uh, beneficial for me studying them. It meant a lot to me. But I would like for Vicar, if you would please close us out in prayer. Sure. Lord God, uh, when we when we sin, we are faced with all sorts of guilt and consequences, uh, and we feel the burden of them. Everyone in this room has has been there and, and may be there right now. Uh, tonight, we ask you that we may you may restore us the joy of your salvation, just as David prayed is our prayer tonight. That it is ours because of Christ. Not no matter our sin and no matter the consequences we're dealing with now. Salvation is ours. Give us that confidence as we go home and in the rest of our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.